Special guest in conversation. This will be his, I counted it up the other day, this will be your third visit to, to see me, Mr Bonneville. Third your time. third visit. Third time lucky, Steve. Third time lucky. <laughs> the, fir- the, the, the first time we talked about Downton, the second time we talked about uh, Paddington. Now, of course, we've had the final Downton, but there's one more to go for Christmas. Yes, it's all a bit confusing because people say, that, oh, the last Downton's been, in fact, mm-hmm. episode nine, which yeah. is the real final one, is on Christmas Day. Oh, mm. Well, everybody's waiting for great things. Everybody was saying <laughs> on the last one, they were going, oh, it was so good, it was the best <laughs> thing on the television. But sad for you because you've had this relationship with people for, you know, for a long time now. And then it's like, I suppose, doing pantomime. At the end of it, you go, we're keeping contact that's you, right. You don't. Of course I love you, but the show folded. That's right. Phrase. Yes, I'm terribly <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I know, but we have been lucky because we've had a, you know, we have formed a very tight bond over the last six years. And um, because uh, we're all involved in sort of different uh, projects and charity things and all that, and we've always been very loyal to each other, helping each other out on, mm. on and supporting each other's things. So last week I was doing a, a charity event with with Annie Lennox and, um, and some of the gang came to that. And then we went on afterwards and met up with a couple of the other, you know, from, from the cast. And last night I was doing a, um, uh, some fundraising with uh, the Academy of St Martin in the Fields and uh, a couple of the gang came to that and so we always, we're always keeping in touch um, yeah. and uh, we can't really let go of each other which is rather nice. Yeah, I said to you last time we spoke, I'm so pleased for you because I remember pe- people in America saying about the success of Downton and how great it is for you, you go, yes I was working 25 years before this, <laughs> excuse me I have done lots and lots of things, far more serious than Downton, <laughs> far more but it's, it's that one thing isn't it that every actor gets and all of a sudden they go, oh my god Goodness me, where's he been? Yeah, that's right. You know, I, the number of people who said, um, "Oh, you must have been relieved when Downton came along." You know, as I say, I've, <laughs> I have managed to eke out a living for twenty-five years, and hopefully a few more years yet. But it has been the most extraordinary and, and wonderful thing to be part of. I'm, I'm enormously uh, proud of, of, of it, and 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 so thrilled that everyone's, t- you know, so many people have taken it to their hearts. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I bought the box there. So <laughs> sorry, I have. I have to admit to being a fan. But there again, I also bought into Paddington because after oh. we had the long chat, my brothers. The biggest Paddington fan and I've got I've got Paddington artwork at home have you which I, oh yes yes I, I, because I, I just I, I remember reading the books originally and I tried to buy the original books but they run so expensive yes. mainly due to you because you bring the blasted film out so all of a sudden the price of everything goes up so original Paddington books go three four hundred pounds you're kidding me seriously wow. I wish I'd kept them all I wish yeah. I'd kept them when I was young but you read books and they yeah. get all tatty, but if I'd save them pristine, they'd be worth a fortune. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm recording um, eleven of them at the moment uh, <laughs> on audio, uh, and I, I'd forgotten because I haven't read read them properly since yeah. I was a kid. But they are gorgeous stories. Oh, they are. Uh, that's a. They're evocative of, of a certain era, or actually, they're quite timeless. Uh, they really are. But um, just the innocent scrapes he gets into, and uh, and and the warmth of his. Uh, of the, and the innocence of his outlook is, is very, I find very very heartwarming. Yeah, and the film was funny mainly because all of a sudden Paddington sort of came to life for us. We'd only ever seen him in the books and in, in the drawings. We didn't we didn't know more about him, but all of a sudden here he had a voice. We could hear his voice, yeah. and here we had the family, the Browns, who'd sort mm. of taken him in, and and it was it was all there for us. But it was so beautifully done, and the. But when we were talking about the filming, you were saying, you know, what I, was, I said, what are you acting with? And you said, well, sometimes a hat on a stick, <laughs> which, which kind of makes it even more complicated as far as I'm concerned. It was, but I was completely blown away when I first saw the animation come to mm. life. And uh, as I probably said last time, you know, within within a couple of minutes of watching the film, I was I was there. I'd, I'd forgotten the bear wasn't real. And, yeah. uh, you just believe just it. Just believe it. Of course, know. but that's a whole fantasy. <laughs> uh, this time, Hugh's, Hugh's in to talk about something. It's, it's, it's far more... So, I, I wish it was frivolous. I wish I could sort of throw it to one side and go, oh, there's plenty of laughs in this bit, but there's not really, <laughs> because uh, he's just come back from India. He's been filming out there for Water Aid. Now, I seem to remember in the dark recesses of my mind, I've spoken to people about Water Aid before. This is where we can make a difference to people who don't have access to water, strange though it might seem in the year 2015. That's exactly right. And... You know, I was out there for a, a few days with Water Aid uh, on my way to actually make a, a movie in India, so it tied in, in very well. Uh, and went to see two projects. Um, one was sort of pre-intervention by Water Aid. One was post-intervention, and the contrast was absolutely astonishing. And it really, really drove home to me how much we take water for granted. We turn on a tap and clean water comes out. We can brush our teeth. We can wash our hands before we you know, go to the loo. We can flush our toilet and the waste goes. And, mm. uh, you know, we can then get on with our day. But visiting a, a village where there is no access to clean water and uh, sanitation and where 
um, the sort of um, education in, in hygiene practices is, is zero. It's pretty devastating to see where you've got kids who are missing school because they've, you know, they're suffering from diarrhea. they the whole village is going to the loo in the in the fields where they're actually growing their crops, mm. um, and you've got water pumps that are uh, that are ineffective and, and uh, because they're you know they're lying below the the, the, the ground level um, in this particular village and, and the water they're pumping is infected. Uh, so you've got this cycle of just sort of uh, of, 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 of illness really, uh, and to break that cycle is, is something that WaterAid and that we can do very simply. So the second village I, I visited, this is in Madhya Pradesh, um, which about two, two and a half hours south of Agra, the Taj Mahal. And uh, the second village I went to, where you've got kids who are who showed me their their hand washing rituals. They have proper loos because in the first village there were literally no loos mm-hmm. in any of the houses. Uh, and the Indian government has said that every every house should have a you know has the right to a loo, has the right to proper hygiene and sanitation education. And uh, so to see these clean swept streets where they have a, um, and everyone in the village, uh, you know, chips in a monthly sort of tariff to, to keep the water pump going. Uh, they have an electric pump. Uh, you know, there was a great pride in the fact that they were now able to, you know, just look after themselves. Water aid pulled out about four years, four, uh, about six years ago. And um, and now this particular village is, um, is is thriving. So that the first thing they think about each each day, a bit like us, isn't how to, you know, get water or, you know, clean water mm. and provide for their family. They can actually nearly take it for granted, but they can, they can at least turn on a, a pump right. uh, and, uh, you know, have clean water come out. They can go to the loo in their own home because they've had toilets built. Their, their streets aren't full of... Uh, manure and so forth uh, because they've got proper drainage and they don't go out and you know go to the loo in their crops yeah. uh, and they, they can then get on with their day and building their lives it's a really simple thing and at the moment what's fantastic is that the government is going to match every pound donated uh, over the next three months and uh, and so we're calling this deliver life and it's really a, a specific targeted campaign to uh, provide money for uh, health centers so that no child is born uh, or, or we can reduce the number of children born in uh, in in, uh, in unsafe conditions because one of the biggest killers um, is uh, is uh, un- unhygienic conditions for for the midwife and the mum. Yeah. Um, I think it's one in five children die in 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 um, you know because of because of lack of uh, good hygiene and clean water simply in the delivery room. Isn't it funny? Something as simple as water, which, as you say, we take for granted. We, we, we were talking about Hong Kong earlier because mm. Hugh's going to be going out there shortly. We couldn't drink out of the tap in Hong Kong when we were there. You had to boil. They don't even have the facility of boiling. They don't. They just well, don't have the water. It's it's under the ground, but it takes money to get it out of yeah, the ground. Yeah. So you know, it's it's it costs something like fifteen quid to um, you know provide in, in this particular campaign to uh, you know provide good water and sanitation and so much is about 15 education. quid yeah just in in, in, a, in one health center to actually just turn it around and, and make sure that they have um decent sanitation and as always as, as with everything it's education that really counts and mm. it, to be in this uh, particular village where i was and in these kids at this school who were beaming and smiling they have a hundred percent attendance record because no one's you know <laughs> getting ill from the lack of hygiene and decent water you know they're able to go back into their homes and teach their family about we wash our hands we wash our hands you know this is how we wash our hands they're so proud to be there Uh, aren't they they're so pleased and it's so sort of enabling that slightly overused words but and and, and empowering um to see the kids you know proudly teaching the next you know their seniors about uh, the way that their lives have changed and that they can you know help help each other so it's a simple thing so a little donation goes a long long way particularly at the moment with the government doubling uh, every yeah. pound uh, donated we are actually really good i think in in this country at giving to the plight of other people we we've just been conditioned over the years that it's a case of you know if if you've got a pound somebody can use that to really great advantage you can change somebody's life with something as simple as a pound that's right and i've i've always been you know with, with the charities i've been lucky enough to be associated with I've, I've always taken care to to make sure that the money is going in the right place because we all have big hearts you know we're all human and we all want to help others but sometimes you know if we're not careful that money can cannot get used in in the right way uh, in certain countries and uh, but you know f- working with water aid this year i've been able to see that you know they they really do target carefully and 
uh, and, and it's effective. You know, I've seen it with my own eyes that uh, you know the, the, the simple change in in, in education, providing a water pump, and in just uh, you know getting getting people um, toilets. It's as simple as yes. that, and it does change. And life. it gives them crops as well. It means you can now grow the crops because you've got the water to irrigate. Well, there's that, and also you, you're you're not you're, you know the labourer isn't off sick. You know, he can actually he or she can actually be there. Um, mm. It's a, it's such a simple cycle, and it takes sometimes quite a lot to educate people to make the link between the illness they're getting and, and the water that they have and the uh, the sanitation they're using uh uh, it all goes back. I mean, a lot of this goes back to you, know, you think of Britain in the um, in the middle of the nineteenth century, where we were plagued with cholera, yes. and it was only the great stink of eighteen whatever it was forty something. Yes. Um, and um, Sir Peter, uh, not Sir Peter Bazalgette. This is um, Sir Joseph Bazalgette. <laughs> Joseph. Um, he uh, you Peter know, he was been a bit Peter would have been yeah, a bit of a stretch. Um, <laughs> he uh, you know he he, he created the sewers, uh, yes. the, the great mighty sewers under London, and within five years cholera had gone because the uh, you know the, the effluent and everything. Thing that was building up in the centre of London had been was being literally swept out. Um, oh, people chuck stuff out of windows. Fleet Street, the River Fleet, used to run down the middle. Exactly. People would throw things. You could find dead carcasses in mm. there of animals and everything else. People urinated in there. I mean, London was uh, was pretty bad. It was pretty bad, and um, of course, it was only when when the Great Stink really hit the Houses of Parliament yes. that, of course, something was done. Yes. <laughs> they used to have to put up big curtains slaked with lime to keep the stench out. It was so bad yeah, on yeah. the Thames. We, 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 we tend to forget that it wasn't that far back. It's not that far back. It wasn't that far, far back. back. Yeah, exactly. Now we are much better. Thank you to Mr. <laughs> to Mr. Yes, exactly. very, ki- very kind of him. Very kind. <laughs> All right, listen, I'll, I'll give you um, a website detail in a moment. We'll have more from Hugh after this. Special guest in conversation, Hugh Bonneville's back. Uh, this time we've sent him to India. I wish I could say we've sent him to <laughs> India. Who, do, who actually approached you about about going out there? Because you do, I know you do a lot of charitable stuff, but do, 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 does it work that people will write you and say, listen, we'd like you to come out to India to see this and, and see if we can get your support behind it? Well, there was a very simple connection to Downton Abbey because about, uh, about a year ago when we were launching Series 5, there was a photograph of myself and Laura Carmichael, who plays Lady Edith, um, in front of our fireplace uh, with a water bottle on the mantelpiece by mistake. It was meant to have been cropped out and somehow that little button on the computer didn't work. So um, this photograph was launched to the world and it became a sort of, you know, it went viral, as they say, and became a huge joke. But luckily, our wonderful PR people turned it around overnight and by the next day, we were all posing with water bottles saying donate to Water Aid. Um, and as a result of that, uh, they, they, they approached me and said, would I care to be a, an ambassador for them? And it seemed a very good and logical fit after our... Um, water <laughs> water error uh, and so I've uh, been getting to know them this year and I happened to be going to do a movie um, in in India in Jodhpur um, with Gillian Anderson directed by Gurinda Chada who did Bend It Like Beckham oh. all about the partition of India in 47 oh wow and so <clears throat> tied it in with a with a bit of a road trip to go to uh, Madhya Pradesh um, you know this this these villages south of uh, Agra before going on to Jodhpur to do, to do the film did it actually shock you when you went over there were you prepared that you know I know we've seen images on the television but it doesn't hit home until you actually are there and you see it I hadn't been to India since 1980 82 when I was backpacking after you know after school and uh, I love India I love the 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 the, the, you know, the noise and the bustle and the smells and the colors and the contrasts um, it is the most confusing and wonderful country <laughs> um, and I think the the extremes of you see the Maharaja's palaces in in, in Rajasthan mm. and this incredible opulence that was there uh, in both in the architecture and in the lifestyle Maharajas who would be given their weight in gold each year by their grateful serfs, yeah. um, like Downton Abbey, and um, <laughs> um, uh, and yet this extreme poverty. I hadn't I hadn't quite I hadn't in 1982 when I went there been to uh, as remote a location as as we went to. Uh, on this little trip um, and it was it was staggering I mean to go with a 10 year old boy this little lad called Pradeep who uh, who is a very bright lad and he goes to this school he walks you know I think several miles to come to this school in this, in this village and you know he, I said well so where do you where do you go to the loo and he walked me out to this field about you know, sort of 300 metres from the school and he says over there pointing at the barley crop and you know sort of it, it, I thought I just sort of immediately thought of my own son I thought my son doesn't have to walk out into a field no. and the 
the lack of dignity that's involved with that and then the likelihood of, of not only the crops not being exactly healthy but also yourself getting ill and therefore missing school and again this cycle of you can see this cycle starting of not of people not being able to just simply get on get on with their day or get in with their lives and so that was really that really hit home when you when you equate it to your own life and yeah. as i say just the, you know, the, the gift we have of turning on a tap and knowing that it's on the whole pretty good yes although plumbers earn a small fortune nowadays i just, I just want to register my complaint about plumbers but there you go that's the but business it, to be so how, how does it work over there they, they then decide on an on an area and then does a team go over and then uh, check out where they can drill it varies it varies from country to country i mean water aid's working actively in in, in in 27 of the poorest countries in the world and um it varies uh, from location to location in in this particular in in this part of india what they're actually doing really is educating the locals in what their rights are because a lot of these rural communities don't actually know that the government has said every home should have a toilet and that by 2017 i think it is we are not going to have, every school will have a toilet and by 2019 i think it is there will be no open defecation as it's called crapping on your crops as i call it um, thanks um, in um, <laughs> in in india uh, i think that's a very ambitious i mean you know there are there are 650 million people across the world who don't have access to clean water um and in and you know there are there are i think it's 65 million within india itself i mean it's a it's a population of a billion so there's a huge number of people I mean, the population of britain uh you know doesn't have access to clean water and and uh, and good sanitation facilities within india um and you know so so it's a big challenge to to to, to turn that around but but so so water aid is really educating the local communities in what their rights are and not in some cases yes they are digging wells and, and providing pumps but really it's about empowering the locals uh, and telling them what they can and can't you know what they what they can expect from the local government and so it goes up the sort of you know council food chain and so it's a lot about about you know badgering the, the councils to say you said that we could have toilets in every home yes. and uh, you jolly well get on and do it so it's uh, which is different from just you know swooping in and saying well don't you worry dears we'll do it you know which is not <laughs> we'll build you a toilet block yeah which is which could obviously in, in in certain situations is vital but really it's about providing this uh, sense of uh, entitlement and empowerment for, 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 for the communities themselves so that they can stand on their own two feet and sit on their own toilets. <laughs> yes, I mean, a, a luxury, of course. I mean, we don't need to worry about things like that. Everything that we have, we take for granted. That's why I've always mm. said to people, when it comes to charity, you're giving to people who've got nothing. Yeah. They have nothing. Mm. We have a million a million times more stuff than they're ever going to have. And, you know, to find in 2015 that there's still millions and millions of people throughout the world who don't have access to running water, clean yeah. water. Yeah. I've seen adverts on the television for Water Aid, you know, where you see animals urinating and then they're sort of swooping up the water and you think, yeah. how can this be allowed to happen? Well, again, there was this, uh, this mother in, uh, in this particular village who you know, her little baby was, you know, covered in sores. Um, and she said that you know the, the little that they that her husband earns during the month they they spend on on going to the to the local hospital because the water you know the the the, the water is in, is creating skin um, diseases and mm. skin irritations um, so they're having to trudge or you know get get transport to the to the local hospital and pay for that so again it's this sense of of, of um, not being able to get yourself out of this cycle of of, of poverty and and uh, illness um, and it's so simple to change it really mm. is um, so every pound really does does help there is a there is a website it's www.wateraid.org it's as it's a simple it's not complicated wateraid.org and uh, for every pound donated uh, between uh, now and the 10th of february it'll be doubled by the by the government which is quite nice isn't it it's nice to it's, it's nice to give something it makes you feel mm. a bit better about life it does and you know we are all we are all joined together as a as a globe so i think the little bits that we can do to help others mm. less fortunate then great uh, changing the subject as we head into the festive season, I don't want to sort of preempt your Christmas. I know that you're recording Paddington books like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> which must be great, but it just means you sit in a little room all by yourself, yeah. reading to yourself, basically, yeah. which is okay. There's nothing bad with that. Are you having family Christmas this year? We are, yes, we are. In fact, we, I think we've got something like um, the 20 for Christmas lunch. Oh, so, for goodness sake. So, have you? Yeah, in fact, my wife and I sat down last night and started literally doing a spreadsheet of what we need to do. <laughs> this, is, this sounds like a giant wall planner to me. They're not all is. staying, are they? Um, about 15 of them are, are so we're, really? we're having to sort of get Z beds and mattresses and all sorts, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be great. Um, 
uh, getting all you know various tendrils of the family together. Yeah. And uh, do you do we're, traditional we're, Christmas? Do you like uh, something mm. traditional, or, or do you do stuff that was that your childhood was based on? Uh, pretty much. I mean, we there's a fairly standard ritual of you know decorating the tree right. and. Um, and you put that up when? Uh, we put that up around, well, it depends. Uh, probably around about, I think we'll do it about the 12th of December, something like that. Oh, right, that's not too bad. Granny gets the, yeah. Granny sends the advent calendar, so <laughs> we have to go through that. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, Father Christmas and the, you know, the, mm. um, I think I saw the sled last year because there was a heck of a burn Did mark you? on the uh, lawn. Um, <laughs> and you have to put stuff out for... Oh, fun. gosh, yes, oh, yes. yes. No, the mince pie and the, the, mince and pie the glass and the of wine. Yes. Yeah. Oh, the glass of wine. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. oh very he's posh got, house. He's, oh, yes. he just got milk in our place. <laughs> 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 we couldn't afford the wine. Yeah. And do you um, spend a lot of money on presents or are you, are you quite we, good? We, we, we know, we, we sort of... We've sort of gone down the route of, of now that we're all... Well, I, I insist on having a stocking. I mean, I would be oh, devastated if, if Father Christmas didn't bring me a stocking. Do you stocking. get satsumas and nuts in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a very important. But we're not we're not we're crazily extravagant, and we've sort of decided that it's the, it's all for the kids. So, um, you know, we don't... The, the grown-ups tend not to give each other presents. It's really we give each other's kids, the, you know, presents. Yes. Except for me. I insist on presents for me. Oh, well, I'm, 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 <laughs> but I, 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 I wouldn't know. If somebody said to me, what would you buy at Hugh Bonneville for Christmas? I wouldn't have the fainter. I thought a smoking jacket or something like that would be quite nice. I don't know. I mean, what would you? What do you need? You get to a certain time in your life where people say, what do you want for Christmas? You say, well, actually, I don't want anything yeah surprise me with something i want i want my family to give a donation to water aid how about that oh <laughs> honestly now that is the worst thing i could ever hear you say on this program a donation to what no, well that's yeah but then they could give a very big donation they could give do you have limits on when i was younger my parents used to say well obviously a long time ago they said it was 20, 25 pounds for your christmas present mm. and if it went over that then that that doubled up as your birthday present as well, uh, well that's a very good policy yes, yes. now we, we do sort of have a, have a, have a limit um what i'm really can I tell you though, Steve, yeah. what I'm really looking forward to this Christmas? I did get tickets for the Magic Circle Christmas show. Oh, you didn't? Yeah. Are you coming on my one? Well, I, I'm not sure. We're going on the 29th of... Uh, oh, no, I'm doing... I've, I've got New Year's... Because you came to one of my ones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good for you. Yeah. But Felix uh, loves magic. Yes, absolutely. But yeah. I did have to... Um, I was virtually there, you know, on the phone because they go in seconds. They do, yes. So I was very excited that we managed to get... Oh, tickets. I'm very pleased you're going back yeah. second time. I've got a number of people this year. I'm doing New Year's Day down there with uh, the show. And it's, it's a very nice. You'll like it. Mm. When was the last time you were there? Two About years? two years ago. About I two years suppose, ago. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Mm. I think you're going to be in for a treat this year. I think it's great because you can you can go to the Magic Circle and you can watch... Clo it's it's not on television. You're watching it yeah. as close up. And then it's a nice little theatre there and you can go to the museum. Oh, How old is Felix it. now? He's 14. See, mm. just mm. the right age for learning. Yes. And in fact, I'll tell you who has a very nice... Oh, there we go, Christmas present. Dynamo's got a magic set out. Oh, really? Dynamo has... A, now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because this is an unusual magic set. This is... Normal magic sets have sort of bog-standard things that have been in there for... I'm sorry to talk shop, but they have... It's the same thing that's been in there for years. Dynamo's magic set uh, has got some really unusual stuff. Fantastic. Well, that, OK, that there was a good go. plug, Steve. I'm, well, I'm going straight to Hamleys. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, the rest of you can log on to wateraid.org, www.wateraid.org. Hugh, always a pleasure. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Thanks. When you're making a show or a piece of theatre, whatever it is, but then suddenly you get nominated for an award and you think, oh, how lovely. And then you're in a race you never asked to be in. And yeah. suddenly you're thinking, I, oh, I'm going to, what if, so if I, suddenly I'm a loser because I didn't win it. It's a very odd thing.